I'm Max. Uh, I am a software engineer from Sydney, Australia, and I work with a TV and entertainment company called Nine Entertainment. And today, I'd like to tell you a story about television. So, once upon a time, there was this thing called broadcast TV. It's still around. Uh, this is just a storytelling device. Uh, any broadcast TV people out there, don't get angry at me, please. Um, and it's sometimes referred to in the industry as linear TV. This is essentially the type of TV that you get where you can watch your shows and uh, listen to music, browse channels, and this is the kind of TV where you can pick up a remote, tune through channels, and yeah, what you think of as TV. Um, there we go. But then this thing called the internet came along. Uh, you may have heard of it. Suddenly, you can stream video, and you can do this on your phone, you can do this on your computer, but this left TVs in a bit of a strange spot. So what about TVs? Enter the CTV, or connected television. This is also known as the smart TV. And uh, yeah, CTVs are essentially internet-connected televisions. They run their own operating systems, they uh, include apps where you can watch your streaming services or play games sometimes. And they come in sort of two broad categories. The first category is up there. We've got the kind of standalone TV unit. These are your uh, smart TVs. So we've got Samsung, LG, those kind of TVs, and a lot of other brands. Then we also have what we call set-top boxes. So these are the TV devices that you would take and you would plug into your normal display or TV, and they provide an operating system for you. Uh, this includes things like the Chromecast, the Apple TV, and the Fire Stick. So I just want to get a gauge of the room. A uh, quick kind of show of hands. Who here owns a smart TV? OK, that's a lot of people. And who here owns a set-top box? OK, also quite a few people. So yeah, set-top boxes and smart TVs, these have kind of transformed the way that broadcasters approach television. And they've created a new type of app, which is the CTV app. So a bit of background. Uh, I work at Nine on a product called Nine Now um, as part of the CTV team there. So Nine Now is what we call a broadcast video on demand or BVOD app, because in uh, video land, we have a lot of acronyms. And this essentially gives us on-demand content, but also gives us traditional broadcast TV content in the form of live streams over the internet. Um, so in Nine Now, we get this from Nine's free-to-air channels, such as Nine, Gem, Go, and uh, some others that you can kind of see there. And we also include things like live events and that kind of stuff. So from a technical, perspe from a technical perspective, uh, this offers a lot of similar challenges to other platforms. So streaming comes with its own set of challenges, things like how do you support Full HD, how do you support uh, like live events and dynamic ad insertion, and also scaling these kind of apps can pose some challenges as well. And these aren't unique to TV, though. So what I'd like to talk about today is CTV apps, and kind of the uh, things that make them a little bit different from mobile, web, and other platforms. And the first kind of one of that that I'd like to touch on is platform fragmentation. So with TVs, there's mm, quite a few brands. Here's some of them. Uh, and these are just some of the ones in Australia. Um, different markets around the world also have their own kind of local brands of TV. And the thing about these brands is that a lot of them, most of them really, tend to have their own operating systems. And similar to how you might have differences between Android and iOS, you also see different native APIs, different sometimes input methods, and uh, different ways of interacting with these different brands of smart TV. Um, so similar to mobile, there's no single TV platform. And every platform has its own unique qualities and uh, APIs. So 
you might be thinking, if only there was a tool that we could learn once and then write our app anywhere. Can anyone think of such a tool? Pretty please? No? OK, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, yep, it's a great talk. Thanks to the Software Mansion for having me here. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, it's React Native. So React Native, but not exactly. You see, TVs are what we call an out-of-tree platform. So these are platforms that aren't Android or iOS, and they take some modifications to get running. Luckily for us, there is a lovely package uh, by Doug Lauder of Expo called React Native TVOS. And uh, this has kind of uh, given us an alternative to sort of building bespoke solutions to all the different platforms in the TV landscape. So uh, can we all just have a big round of applause for Doug Lauder of Expo? Truly an awesome package. <laughs> um, yeah, and what this does is it's a fork of React Native that adds support for Apple TV and Android TV. And with this, we can write our normal kind of React Native app with some modifications and have it running on uh, your Apple TV or Android TV. And this also covers quite a large market. Android TV is a platform similar to Android. And because of that, you also have forks off of it. So things like Google TV and uh, quite a few others. So that covers Apple and Android. But what about like all those others from the screen before? Uh, Samsung and LG, for example, for example um, have a quality where you can run an app as a web view. So one of the uh, approaches that we take is we have what we call a show app, and that runs as a app inside of a TV. You can install that from one of the TV stores. And then this will uh, provide the assets to launch the app. And once it's launched, it points towards a website. Uh, and you basically have a web app. Um, this is quite good, because in the React Native world, when we want to be able to target something on the web, we can use React Native Web. And all of a sudden, we've gone from just two platforms to quite a lot more. And this is also kind of similar to a progressive web app. We're creating a show app. We're putting in a website inside of that. And then we can also remotely update that over the web. Um, but as with TVs in a lot of cases, there's still some sort of developer experience uh, limitations. For example, with uh, a lot of the uh, web view based TVs, uh, TVs have a pretty long shelf life. So you can end up seeing some pretty old firmware. So uh, this is an important point, guys. Please update your TV firmware. Pretty please. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, pretty straightforward. Uh, we've got our platforms. It's building. Um, but you know, how do we develop this? How do we build out the app and build out the features, the native integrations, all that kind of stuff? So let's take a look at a bit what it's like to develop on a TV app. Over here, we can see the Apple TV simulator. And on some of the TVs, like Apple here, uh, you get a pretty nice simulator that you can kind of interact with with a virtual uh, remote. And this is a pretty good thing for developer experience. Uh, as with mobile, we like to develop on emulators. And then we like to go and test them later when we uh, want to try it out with a physical device. Um, but of course, a simulator can only take you so far. And that's why it's also important always to test on physical devices, such as these. So this is a grid of four different TVs from back in the office. And uh, out of the frame here, there's four more TVs. And then behind that, there's about eight more TVs. So there's a lot of TVs. And uh, this is kind of what reality looks like for developing on TVs. All these different platforms, they all have their own quirks, similar to what you might see on Android and iOS. And because of that, it's important to test each and every one, um, or as many as you want to have confidence in. And uh, yeah, make sure that you have a good foundation um, to kind of go off of. Uh, and a fun fact, uh, it is a little bit tricky to get the remote control to work on these. Uh, sometimes it's 
a good strategy if you're wondering uh, is to like sort of take the remote, put it right up against the TV, and then kind of like hold your hand over it so like you don't turn off two TVs at once. Uh, it takes some practice, but it, it works fairly well. Um, and yeah, so we also have a similar kind of setup for uh, set-top boxes. Inside of here, we've got a whole heap of things. There's some Apple TVs, some Chromecast, uh, Foxtel. And these kind of link back to that TV array, and we can switch between them with a HDMI splitter. So this might seem a little bit like overkill. And that would be a fair point. But I think that testing on devices is pretty important, and on TVs especially, where you see so much different range in the brands and so much different range in the uh, like different platforms. Testing on devices can really give you a step ahead and make sure that your app is in tip-top shape. Another thing to kind of note about TVs uh, is that a lot of them actually don't have a ton of performance to work with. And you don't necessarily see this when you're in a simulator. For example, uh, many TVs will only have one gigabyte um, of or one or two gigabytes of memory, and oftentimes single core CPUs. So it can be a lot like uh, developing on a low-end phone. And these resources often have to be shared with other apps. Uh, the other interesting fact is kind of like uh, TV apps tend to be content-oriented. Um, so this means that you have a lot of images, a lot of video, a lot of multimedia stuff. And especially your session times can end up being pretty long, uh, which means if you have a memory leak in your app, it might show up eventually after two or five hours of watching. So uh, yeah, it's important to test for that kind of stuff. Uh, change the topic. Ever lost a remote? Yeah, that's fun. So input on TVs is quite a big topic. But uh, to kind of cover the sort of brief range of what is inside of it, uh, just like, there's many, uh, just like there are many brands, there's also many remotes. So Chromecast has kind of a D-pad like this. And this is common of a lot of different remotes in the TV space. Uh, and, but you also see kind of other remotes. So for instance, we've got Apple, who have their trackpad like this. And we've got LG, who have like a magic wand. Uh, so uh, with the wand, you can kind of point it at your TV, and you get like a mouse pointer and uh, yeah, it, it, they all have like their kind of unique uh, features. But from a engineering perspective, this means that you actually need to account for quite a lot of different input methods. For example, in a D-pad, you have a discrete set of events. You press right, you press left, up and down. But on the Apple TV remote here, uh, it's a continuous set of key events. So that means you need to process it as a stream. You need to make sure that you're accounting for which element you want to land on. And with the LG one, you're kind of making a mouse pointer. So that means you need to say, uh, which element am I looking at? And um, how can I make sure that clicking on that is going to do what the user expects it to? Um, yeah, so this kind of problem is known as focus management and spatial navigation. And it's actually a pretty interesting problem, because you can tackle it from different ways. Uh, over here, we can see. Uh, kind of an example of that. So on the right here, we've got one of the elements in our app. And you can kind of navigate between things. So this uh, focus management is a little bit similar to making accessible tab navigation on the web, if you've ever worked on that kind of thing. The user has a single focus element. And you need to kind of determine what is going to be the next element and change that depending on the type of input method you have. So you can see on the left here, uh, this is a sort of visualization that um, our principal engineer, Luke, made. Uh, like We use kind of a direct, uh, directed graph approach. And this acts as our own kind of abstraction on top of the different uh, APIs for input and focus that the different TVs provide. So when you're focused onto an element, you can navigate left, right, up, down. And uh, you can also sort of normalize the key events from different platforms. So since many platforms will emit different key events depending on the remotes, and sort of fit them into this system and have a nice declarative API across all of it. Uh, but there's also some edge cases with TV focus. Things like modals, screen readers, 
And what if an element is removed or added during runtime? And of course, all the different modes have their own key events. There's quite a few different cases to consider. Luckily, there's also some fantastic open source projects that handle this. Um, while we at Nine have our own bespoke solution, uh, there's also a cool project called React TV Space Navigation from BAM um, that provides a similar kind of API where you can uh, declaratively say where you want focus to go based on the inputs. And then there's also the uh, built-in TV focus system uh, for React Native TVOS uh, that was added recently by the uh, team at site. Uh, so yeah, it's a pretty complicated problem, but there's a growing number of solutions out there. And yeah, if you're interested in TV apps, I'd encourage you to like, take a try at it. So that's a lot of stuff about TVs. And I feel like I should address uh, the elephant in the room, which is like, TVs are pretty niche. Why should I care? And while that's true, I think that TVs also are kind of a good example of cross-platform development in general. You've got all these different devices. You've got all these different ways of interacting and all these different APIs. And from that, we can kind of learn a few things, such as oh, always test on device. So performance uh, and different quirks between the platforms. Testing is always important, no matter whether you're building a TV app or not. And also building a culture of code sharing. One of the great advantages of React Native, of course, is that you can code share. You can have one code base where you share it between all these different TV platforms or all these different web or desktop or uh, native platforms. And while this does come with some challenges, such as making sure that you have a uh, good code review process or linting rule set up to avoid uh, doing things on one platform that might not work on another. Uh, it can also provide the great advantage of code sharing, and I think that's a great thing to have. And the last one is, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, I saw this in the React Native blog, um, but there's a great blog post there called the React Native Many Platform Vision. And that kind of talks about uh, the React Native team's view for how uh, to approach different platforms in React Native, uh, so just give it a read. And um, yeah, respecting the platform is an important one. At the end of the day, what sets React Native apart is that it's not just a way to target multiple platforms, but it's a way to target multiple platforms with native APIs. It's not just an abstraction. It's a set of bindings. And this gives you a really powerful way to build an experience that doesn't just uh, work well across all platforms, but also feels like a platform or feels like an app that was built for the target device. And yeah, respecting the platform, that's kind of the idea. Um, but also remembering that, as with anything in software, there's always going to be trade-offs. Um, like we saw with Focus, we ended up building our own kind of solution. And I think it's important to kind of approach everything with an open mind. Um, so yeah, uh, the future for TVs is looking pretty bright. Expo TV, oh, sorry, Expo 50 dropped with TV support. Um, so if you want to try out what it's like to build an Expo app with TV, um, go do that. It looks awesome. And um, yeah, with the new architecture and um, various other things in the pipeline for React Native, uh, there's going to be, I think, a lot of performance kind of wins that we can take back for TV and should be pretty nice. So. Um, Thank you uh, for real this time.